encountered this place, Oakwood, was a little over 20 years ago when there was a young man in Troy named Lee Harris who was beaten up by the Troy police. And his family were uh, members of this congregation. This was still a functioning uh, Presbyterian uh, congregation at that time. And, the con and it was uh, unique in the sense that it was one of the only congregations in Troy and probably in the capital area that was a, f a fully multiracial integrated congregation. And the pastor um, and the congregation came together in support of Lee. There was a whole sort of Lee Harris Defense Committee, and we would hold our meetings here in this church. This church was the backbone of that defense committee, raised money for him, uh, gathered community support, um, and it was really crucial. And so that's every time I come here to Oakwood, that's what I think about, and I think it's a great tradition to build on uh, when we're, uh, as we're moving forward. Professor Vitale's book, The End of Policing, um, I, I, for whatever my endorsement is worth, I think it's a remarkable book, and I urge everybody to read it. And part of what's remarkable about it is that uh, what he does is he sort of accomplishes a number of different tasks in one book. Um, he provides a history of the police um, and the role of the police, um, specifically in regard to how the police relate to issues in this country of um, the role of protecting the ruling class, the racism of the police, policing of political dissent, criminalization of homelessness, of mental illness, of sex work, and of drug addiction. And he does all of this with a political and class analysis that takes us through, among other things, the development of an implementation of austerity under neoliberal policies in the past 40 years. He also provides a history and account of movements against police brutality, and he provides a history and a critical analysis of a wide range of reform efforts that, uh, that have occurred in communities and cities around the country relating to the police. And what is most important is a really unique contribution that uh, Professor Vitale makes which is to examine why none of these reform efforts will ever truly get to the fundamental structural framework which has created and maintained abusive, racist, and unaccountable law enforcement agencies in this country, and why a different framework that relates to security, safety, and just and peaceful communities needs to emerge. Now, in this area, we, of course, have a, our, our own long history of resistance to police abuse, and that means that we also have a long history of police abuse. Um, I'm going to talk about Troy uh, and a few things about what's happening in Troy right now, um, just to set this stage. You know, I, I don't live in Troy. I live in Albany. But it, it appears to me, as an outsider to Troy, that the city of Troy is sort of aiming for like sort of top spot to be the number one in the country um, in regard to police shootings of black men and cover-ups of police misconduct. Especially when we consider how small a city this is, about 50,000 people, and how small the police department is. We're talking about 130 officers. Um, and considering that, within less than a mile radius of where we are right now, in the past two and a half years, there have been three black men shot by the Troy police. Actually, I mean, one is a little, one is actually about two miles away. Two of them are within a half mile of where we are right now. Um, in in um, August 2015, Thaddeus Faison was killed by the police, by the Troy police. In April 2016, Edson Thevenin, um, literally, a couple of blocks from here down the hill was killed by the Troy police. And in August 2017, um, also just a few blocks from here in the other direction, Dameek McDonald uh, was shot but not killed by the Troy police. In the Thevenin case, we are in a unique position to know with absolute certainty that the Troy police engaged in an active cover-up of the circumstances of Mr. Thevenin's death. We know this because the New York State Attorney General's office 
did an exhaustive investigation and concluded, among other things, that the story promulgated by Sergeant Randy French, who shot and killed Mr. Thevenin, the story as to why he shot and killed Mr. Thevenin was a lie. And this is what the Attorney General's Office has demonstrated clearly. And that the Detroit police knew from the night that it happened that, that, that the story that Sergeant French put out was not true. It couldn't be true. And nonetheless, the Troy police promoted his story as the truth of what happened that night. And as I'm sure everybody here knows, not only did the Troy police do that, but the Rensselaer County District Attorney um, rushed the case into a grand jury in less than a week, which is unheard of, put Sergeant French into the grand jury as a witness where he received immunity. In other words, he cannot be prosecuted for killing Mr. Thevenin. And did some other things in the grand jury that, that served to cover up the facts of what happened. And so, you know, and I'm, I'm, I guess I'm glad I'm not a resident of Troy for this reason, because Troy has the distinction of having the only elected sitting district attorney in the country who is under indictment for covering up the police shooting of a civilian. So, you know, you folks from Rensselaer County, you, you know, you need to find another district attorney somehow. We need to get him out and somebody else needs to get in. In the McDonald case, to make McDonald, the DA finally yielded to public pressure and recused himself from the investigation. An investigation is now underway, being handled by the Schenectady County District Attorney's <laughs> Office, which, you know, doesn't necessarily have a stellar record of these things, but at least it's not Rensselaer. Um, we don't know yet how deep the taint was by the initial investigation. The initial investigation was done by the Troy Police. The initial investigation was under the leadership of the Rensselaer County DA's office. Um, we are concerned that they may have, um, as they did with Thevenin, tainted this so much that it may be impossible to get justice for Demik McDonald. But we don't fully know that yet. Hopefully not. Um, those of you here who are Facebook friends of mine may have seen this question that I posed on Facebook this morning. Um, so Troy has a long history of resistance to abusive, racist law enforcement uh, behavior. And the question I posed on Facebook was, who, who knows when the earliest recorded example of that was and who the famous historical figure was who was at the center of it? Anybody know? Harry yes, Harry Tubman. And when did it take place? Do you know? It's 1860. Okay. So in 1860, that's right. Um, in 1860, Harriet Tubman was visiting Troy on her way from somewhere else to Boston. Was in Troy when a man named Charles Nally, who uh, was had been uh, enslaved in the South and had escaped and come to Troy and was living in Troy, was captured under the Fugitive Slave Act. And it was brought before a U.S. magistrate um, at First and State Street in Troy, you know, also about a mile from where we are right now. And crowds started to gather. And Harry Tubman heard this. She went there. And everybody knew who she was, of course. And she took leadership of the situation. The end result, I'm not going to tell the whole story, although it's a great story, but the end result is that under Harriet Tubman's very courageous leadership, and you know, essentially um, tricking some of the federal marshals and, and, and like getting people ready to, to leap into action when she gave the signal, they freed him. They got him out of the clutches of, of the uh, slave catchers. They rushed him to the river, got him in a boat. Um, and he went across the river to Waterloo, where the slave catchers had telegraphed ahead of time, so there were law enforcement people there waiting to grab him. They did grab him again, and Harry Tubman got there in another boat, and basically, uh, I mean, it was basically a battle, and they freed him, and they got him in a horse-drawn carriage, and he went on his way towards Schenectady or something like that. Um, so a, a, an incredible story that takes place right where we are now um, of resistance, of courage, of creativity. Um, the story is that she actually, she tricked the marshals who didn't know who she was because she sort of covered her face a little bit and they thought she was just some old lady and they said, get out of the way, old lady. 
but um, that was her signal for, you know, she gave a signal to the crowd and they leapt into action. So um, we're in the spirit of Harriet Tubman, or at least hopefully we're in the spirit of Harriet Tubman and in, with the courage of Harriet Tubman. Um, so with, with all of that being said, um, it really is a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Vitale. He's a professor of sociology at Brooklyn College and the coordinator of the Policing and Social Justice Project at Brooklyn College. Um, he spent the past 25 years writing about policing, um, studying policing, and in addition to his academic research, he has consulted with police departments and human rights organizations internationally and serves on the New York State Advisory Committee of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Um, it's really a pleasure, it's an honor to introduce Professor Vitale, and you're going to love his talk and buy the book. All right, let's begin. Chapter one. No. Uh, get your notebooks out. No. Uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, who played a role in getting me here, John and Sarah and others. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be in this space uh, with the kind of working community connection to it all. Um, for those who don't know, uh, I, I myself am a unionist, but my family, my father's family, were all coal miners in southern Illinois and were activists in the United Mine Workers, the Progressive Mine Workers Caucus within the United Mine Workers. So uh, in many ways, I, I come out of some of these uh, same historical struggles. Above my desk are ribbons that my grandfather and his brothers wore in marches for the eight-hour day. So uh, a constant reminder of the need to, to have these basic struggles. And I think in a way, it is that larger political analysis that, that shapes this work that I've provided. We were talking earlier at dinner about the fact that so much of the scholarship around policing is done in a kind of ahistorical and in a very narrow framework. It's about evaluating the effectiveness of an institution within its own context without analyzing the nature of that institution within the larger state, its effect on the society, its historical role, etc. cetera. So uh, that, that has uh, been at the center of my analysis, trying to situate the police uh, in that way. So, uh, how many people know who Deborah Danner was? Is that name familiar to any one or two? A few people, very good. So, Deborah Danner was a middle aged African American woman who lived in a public housing development in the Bronx. She was well known to public housing authorities, local police, the local emergency room because she had a history of uh, mental health crises. And uh, one day, one of her neighbors called the police because she believed that Deborah was having a mental health crisis. Didn't investigate herself, but heard loud noises and called police, hoping to get help. And the police in New York City go on a quarter of a million of such calls every year, a quarter of a million. And while most of those calls are handled somewhat um, effectively or at least without tragic consequences, in this case, officers demanded entry to her home, cornered her in the bedroom. She had a pair of scissors. They made some effort to calm her down. She put the scissors down. But instead of leaving her alone, they, they, which is what she thought was going to happen, they were like, now you've got to come with us. She then picked up a baseball bat and was shot to death. And while I said, as I said, most such interactions tend to res be resolved either informally or with a trip to the emergency room or sometimes the lockup, it's also the case that a quarter of all people killed by police are having a mental health crisis at the time they're killed. 
So this was not the first incident in New York. It wasn't even the first one that year, I believe. Uh, certainly not the only one that year. This was only just uh, two years ago, roughly. Um, the police department, the city council, there was some introspection about what was going on. So the city council decided to hold some hearings with the police department to talk about whether or not the police department needed additional resources to do additional training on how to handle people with a mental health crisis. Of course, the officer that killed her had had some special training and had a taser on him at the time that he decided to shoot her with a handgun instead. So, as often happens in these circumstances, a reporter called me up and asked me to, to provide some commentary about what was going on. Did I like this kind of training? We got the CIT training, we got the Memphis model. You know, I'm familiar with a lot of the training regimes that go on. And this reporter wanted me to get into the strengths and weaknesses of these different training regimes and was the city council calling for the right interventions? Were they gonna give the police department enough money to truly do this training? And I finally, <laughs> I stopped her and I said, you know, I'm not interested in fine-tuning the police response to these calls. I'm interested in ending it. And to her credit, that is the quote that ended up in the newspaper. <laughs> so, Over the last 40 years, we have seen an explosive increase in the scope and power of policing. Now this is not to say that therefore 50 years ago everything was great and policing was not a problem. We'll talk about that deeper history in a minute. But there has been this explosive increase in the scope, the kinds of things they deal with, and their power, the tools that they have and utilize to deal with them. Everything from the war on drugs, school policing, dealing with folks who are homeless, having a mental health crisis, every societal problem has been turned over to the police to deal with. And this creates a tremendous number of problematic encounters, like the quarter of people they kill who are having a mental health crisis, like Deborah Danner. Now, there's, a, there's been a response to these kinds of killings. There has been an amazing and sustained level of mobilization, and that's the primary reason we're all here tonight, is that has created the context for this to be a meaningful conversation. There were long periods in my career where there was no real interest in policing. After 9-11, there was no real space to have a critique of policing. So I went and did work in Asia and Africa. I lived in South Korea for a while. I worked with human rights groups out there, wrote about protests, policing, etc. cetera. And, uh, but we're in a different moment now where there is this possibility of a real conversation. Now the problem is, is that the conversation about police reform has been framed in a particular way that I don't think is very helpful. Mm -hmm. And this is true both of politicians, po police leaders, mm -hmm. and in many cases, activists. Now part of the problem is, is that the, the history of organizing and outrage about policing has been primarily episodic and explosive, so that there's a high profile, egregious act of horrible misconduct that engenders explosive responses that are never really or certainly not entirely about that incident. The reason there's explosive protests is because of the everyday indignities that police meet out on some communities more than others. The accumulation of a rage and a sense of the fundamental injustice of the institution. But what typically happens is that that rage gets channeled into a certain number of demonstrations, 
with certain people stepping up into leadership positions who tend to put forward the saying never really get implemented and B aren't really going to lead to substantive changes. But a lot of this is because there's not been any sustained engagement with the issue so that folks who find themselves in a community that has this outrage, they have this kind of well-worn litany of demands to make that sound very appealing on the surface but have not really been interrogated at this local level. Many police scholars know the limitations of these demands, people who looked at this over time, but many community people do not. So what do they call for? Well, they call for things like community policing. Now uh, body cameras is the new technical fix we're going to use for policing. They want some additional training. They want some enhanced diversity within their police departments. All, uh, they want new mechanisms for accountability. They want civilian review boards. But there's no evidence that any of this makes any difference in the scope and intensity of policing. We have now a lot of evaluation research about these things, but even if we didn't have that, we can tell that when these things get implemented, like community policing was in the 1980s, it made no difference. So let's maybe take a couple and just think about why they couldn't possibly be the solution. Now these reforms are typically driven by a particular ideological framework, a kind of liberal framework, and I mean that in a sort of technical sense, that there is a mindset that understands government and the police in a particular way that the state, whatever its limitations, is basically the best sort of possible way to represent the general will, the best interests of the public writ large. We understand it has limitations and it can have short-term challenges like many of us feel are occurring now, but overall a liberal democratic framework is the best we've got and they're, they have a whole set of theoretical beliefs about that this is the most kind of representative and in the best interest of the general will. And that policing exists to defend the rule of law, which has been produced by this legitimate liberal state for everybody's best interest. So that the reforms they put forward are reforms that are designed to reinforce the legitimacy of the state, the rule of law, and the police. So we need to, so in their mindset, reforming the police means taking out individual bias, eliminating unprofessional conduct, and orienting the police more concretely into enforcing the rule of law because that is what sets us all free. This creates this framework that makes civilization possible. This is the liberal mindset, right? So that community policing, diversity training, bringing in a more diverse police force, these are all efforts to restore legitimacy, public confidence in the police, and also to make the police more professional and less biased. So let's look at implicit bias training, fair and impartial policing. This is very popular across the country. There, you know, following Ferguson and all of this, there's a sense though that race is a problem with policing. We don't understand exactly what the problem is, but we know that Black people are upset, so it must have something to do with race. <laughs> so implicit bias is the perfect liberal antidote to concerns about the racialized nature of policing because it allows local mayors and police chiefs 
to say that they are doing something about the racial problem of policing while doing absolutely nothing. And here's why. Implicit bias training, again, this is perfect for liberals, rests on the idea that the race problem in policing is implicit, which is to say it is unconscious and unintentional. It's based on this research that is done by social psychologists in laboratory settings where people are flashed these images and they have these little buttons to push and they're, they're like positive and negative and as the is images come at them they find that people have a kind of minute microsecond bias for one set of images over the no another and that there's a racialized pattern to this. This is great because it turns out nobody is responsible for racism. No one is actually intentionally racist. These institutions don't have any racial bias in them. This is all just something deep in our lizard brain <laughs> that can't be helped. And that the solution to this is to remind officers to please not shoot any unarmed black people unintentionally. <laughs> Now, the research is deeply problematic, even. I mean, not only is it just nonsensical on its face, even the research is deeply problematic. First of all, it, they haven't been able to do reproducibility as a validity problem, which is that when they give people the test in individuals over and over again, the results are not consistent. Now, they find in the aggregate certain tendencies but not at the individual level. But they got another problem, which is that they have never once been able to design a study that shows that after I've shown an implicit bias in this micro-testing, that this has any effect on my actual behavior in the world. But even if it did, this again assumes that the problems of policing and race are implicit and not explicit. Which, of course, when we look for racism in policing, we find it. <laughs> but even if there wasn't racism in policing, and I think it's a mistake in some ways to overstate the racial bias of individual officers. There are places where it's quite overt and is revealed but we also have a growing number of big city police departments that are led by African Americans where a majority of the officers are African Americans in places like Washington DC, in Detroit, uh, places like Philadelphia where the police department basically looks like the population of Philadelphia. Uh, the US is 73% white and 75% of police officers are white. The, there's not a huge out of whack distribution between police and the public in the United States. This is kind of a myth. But the problems of policing and race cannot be reduced to individual bias. These are structural problems built into the nature of policing. So I talked before about, well, we have this sort of 40-year history of problematic policing. But there's another problematic history that's a problem that's hundreds of years in the making. It goes to the fundamental nature of policing. The history of policing is a history of managing inequality. If we look carefully at the development of the various forms of policing, through the late 18th and early 19th century, what we find is it is directly linked to the primary regimes of accumulation of that period, which are colonialism, industrialization, and slavery. So for liberals who have this mindset that policing is just the legitimate expression of the need of the state to maintain the rule of law, they will point to the London Metropolitan Police as their standard bearer, the first real police force in, in the, all the 
textbooks about policing all start with the London Metropolitan Police. Started in 1829, they're uniformed, they're professional, they're supposed to be politically neutral, they're supposed to defend the rule of law as an alternative to relying on the army or the militia. But what gets left out of this history is where the idea came from. So the police in the UK, we call them Bobbies, because they were named after Sir Robert Peel, Robert Bob the Bobbies. He was Home Secretary when he launched this idea, got it through Parliament to create the London Metropolitan Police. But what is erased from that history is what his prior job had been, which was that he was in charge of the English occupation of Ireland. <laughs> yeah. He invents a series of precursor police forces to help him manage the occupation of Ireland. Now that occupation had historically been managed primarily by troops and militias. But what happens is, is that Britain is involved in the Napoleonic Wars. The troops are needed overseas. The state is near bankruptcy. He doesn't have access to the troops. Rural agrarian resistance increases because this is a horribly exploitative system. And he needs a way to manage it. He creates the Irish Peace Preservation Force. <laughs> that is a paramilitary unit that is embedded in local communities and tries to build up legitimacy and the ability to gather local intelligence, rapid response, <coughs> preventative counterinsurgency, basically. This is where he figures out the value of a more legitimate, civilianized response to what in London are not problems of colonialism, but problems of the rise of an industrial workforce. Millions of people streaming into cities from the countryside who need to be molded and shaped into a docile, disciplined, industrial workforce. And the London Metropolitan Police prove incredibly adept at suppressing strikes, breaking up meetings, and also putting down bread riots, political rallies, and these kinds of things. And this is the untold origins of much of Western policing. Now we had our own colonial police force in the United States, more than one really, but the best known were the Texas Rangers. <clears throat> Texas Rangers were used to wipe out the indigenous population of what was then a part of Spain, and then Mexico, and then the Republic of Texas, and then finally part of the US. But throughout that history, they're involved in vigilante violence, extermination of the indigenous population, and the mass displacement of what had been Spanish and Mexican landholders throughout the territory. The first state police force in the United States, the Philadelphia, uh, the Pennsylvania State Police, formed in 1905, was built on the model of the U.S. occupation forces in the Philippines at the end of the Spanish-American War. There was a direct transfer of technology, ideas, and personnel from those occupation forces to the Pennsylvania police, state police, who were created to more efficiently and effectively suppress the workers' movements that were erupting throughout Pennsylvania at that time. So to think that reforms that are designed to restore police legitimacy will be sufficient to overcome the basic nature of policing as a tool for managing the problems of inequality, that's gonna be doomed to fail. So I'll just go into one more, why community policing is not the solution. Yes, we, we have this idea that if only the police understood the nature of the community, that this would somehow improve their behavior 
towards the community. So let's have a lot of meetings with the community. They'll get to know the community. And this will somehow magically cause them to behave in a radically different way. That this will somehow change the fundamental nature of what they do. Well, it won't. What it does is it actually intensifies what they do. Community policing is about turning neighborhood problems into policing problems, which is already the problem we're in. The police become the only part of local government that says to the public, every day, come and bring us your problems and we'll try to figure out how to solve them. But what tools do they have for solving community problems? They don't have jobs. They don't have affordable housing. They don't have mental health care services. They don't have real youth programs, addiction treatment. What do they have? They have handguns and handcuffs and ticket books and threats. And we are told that those are the tools that are going to make the community better. But those are exactly the kinds of tools that are undermining the stability of communities, that are reproducing the fundamental inequalities that drive the kinds of problems that these communities have in the first place. And it's about a fundamental political problem. While the 19th century was characterized by colonialism, slavery, and industrial production, in the United States, the 20th, late 20th, early 21st century is characterized by this neoliberal restructuring. The production of a massive underclass that is completely removed from the formal economy, the hollowing out of the social safety net, a broad bipartisan commitment to austerity politics, and the police have been left to deal with that growing inequality. So how do police spend their time dealing with community problems, which means mostly low-level quality of life, broken window stuff, kids hanging out, low-level drug dealing, homeless people, bothering me, mentally ill people, making the park unusable. If you ever spend time in the back of a police car, they're not chasing bank robbers. They're not making arrests of armed thieves. They're chasing high school kids off the corner, harassing homeless people, writing tickets for low-level infractions. These are the problems that neoliberalism has intensified mass homelessness, mass untreated mental illness, failing schools that have been replaced with more cops in the schools instead of more instruction. So the solutions to policing are not going to be technocratic fixes. There's no technology that's going to fix policing. There's no training regime that's going to fix policing. There's no change in the management of policing that is going to fix this problem. It's a political problem. It's a political problem that gets to the core of the direction that the country is headed in. This replacing of actual jobs, participation in the formal labor market, a state that tries to deal with basic human needs with a rapacious neoliberalism that is perfectly happy to grind people into horrible poverty and then use policing to manage the consequences of their conditions. So in a way, I'm not here to try to urge you all to join a police accountability movement. I'm here to urge you to join a racial and economic justice movement. Because the only way we're going to make any real progress in reducing the abusive, invasive, and aggressive policing is to fundamentally change the nature of what we ask them to do. When the police are asked to wage a war on crime, a war on disorder, a war on gangs, a war on drugs, a war on terrorism, they are not going to be friendly, they're not going to be respectful, 
and they're not going to produce true safety and justice for communities that have been left out of the global economy. That we have to shift directions on how we approach policing. I was invited to go down to Ferguson a couple of weeks ago, Ferguson, Missouri, where folks have been fighting the fight. They got the federal government to come in and give them this consent decree with this great language about community policing and body cameras and new training. And they have gone to the meetings and sat on the oversight committees, and it's not working. It is not helping. They can see that it is not going to change anything. And instead, what they and other communities across the country are doing is that they are articulating a politics of community investment as an alternative to ever-increasing police budgets. The Center for Popular Democracy, which is a kind of network of community-based, low-income groups across the country, they have a great new report out where they really did excellent budget analysis in about a dozen cities across the country and showed that in good times and bad times, the police budgets just keep expanding. There's always money for more police and that cities who were spending 20, 25, 30 percent of their municipal budget on policing go around saying we don't have any money for after school programs, we don't have any money for drug treatment slots, we don't have any money for community based health care, mental health treatment, restorative justice programs in schools. They have plenty of money they have made an ideological, political decision to spend it on repression. And that is what has got to change. We've got to take our critique of policing and replace it or add to it, not replace, but add to it a positive agenda for investing in local places, in communities, in individuals. So let me just close maybe with a little quote here from the book that will kind of highlight all of this. So more than anything, what we really need is to rethink the role of police in society. The origins and function of the police are intimately tied to the management of inequalities of race and class the suppression of workers and the tight surveillance and micromanagement of black and brown lives have always been at the center of policing. Any police reform strategy that does not address this reality is doomed to fail. We must stop looking to procedural reforms and critically evaluate the substantive outcomes of policing. We must constantly reevaluate what the police are asked to do and what impact policing has on the lives of the police. A kinder, gentler, and more diverse war on the poor is still a war on the poor. And as long as the police are tasked with waging these wars, we will have aggressive and invasive policing that disproportionately criminalizes young, poor, male, and non-white people. <clears throat> We need to push back on this dramatic expansion of police power and its role in the mass incarceration at the heart of the new Jim Crow and of neoliberalism. What we are witnessing is a political crisis at all levels and in both parties our political leaders have embraced a neoconservative politics that sees all problems as police problems. They have given up on using government to improve racial and economic inequality and seem hell-bent on worsening these inequalities and using the police to manage the consequences. For decades, they have pitted police against the public while also telling them to be friendlier and improve community relations. They can't do both. We are told that the police are the bringers of justice. They are here to help maintain social order so that no one should be subject to abuse. The neutral enforcement of the law will set us all free. This understanding of policing, however, is largely mythical. 
American police function despite whatever good intentions they have as individuals as a tool for managing deeply entrenched inequalities in a way that systematically reproduces injustice for the poor, socially marginal, and non-white. Part of the problem is that our politicians, media, and criminal justice institutions too often equate justice with revenge. Our criminal justice system has become a gigantic revenge factory. Three strikes laws, sex offender registries, the death penalty, and abolishing parole are about retribution, not <coughs> public safety. Whole segments of our society have been, de been deemed always already guilty. This is not justice, it is oppression. Real justice would look to restore people and communities to rebuild trust and social cohesion, to offer people a way forward, to reduce the social forces that drive crime, and to treat both victims and perpetrators as full human beings. Our police and larger criminal justice system not only fail at this, but rarely see it as even related to their mission. These institutions are not going to get fixed through some technocratic jiggling with the procedures that they follow. We have got to fundamentally reorient how our governments approach the problems that we experience. And we can do this. Every chapter of the book lays out concretely problems with policing that can be dealt with by eliminating that type of policing. We don't need nicer school police. We don't need our school police to be mentors. We don't need better training for school police. School policing is a terrible idea. It does not make our schools any safer. It is predicated on myths and serves to reproduce the privatization of education, high stakes testing, and the driving out of young people who can't follow through the new educational regimes. And that's why it stays around. Not because it makes our kids any safer. So we need that kind of analysis that quits calling for making the school police nicer, friendlier, more professional, and less biased. We need to eliminate school policing, the war on drugs, the criminalization of sex work, the constant harassment of homeless and mentally ill individuals, the repression of social movements, the expansion of the border into every aspect of society. These are the real solutions to abusive policing. Thank you. Um, so, um, in, in our conversation before, um, Alex asked me to start with some questions based on some of the conversation we had before. So, I'm just going to do an initial question to sort of get this going, but really, um, that's not to preclude all the questions from the audience as well, and, and we have enough time to have, I think, a, a lot of questions and a lot of discussion. But what I want to pose as sort of a starting point um, is, is what I feel as a dilemma. And so the dilemma is um, not that I disagree one iota with the analysis that Alex has just presented. But the dilemma is sort of a day-to-day -day grounding in the work that we do in our communities, for me as a criminal defense lawyer, but I do in the courts every single day, which is there's value because we have no choice when we're in that work as a criminal defense lawyer, as a community activist working on police issues. There's no choice but to work for what in essence are these reforms 
which again i don't disagree they don't really get to the heart of the problem and yet that's what we do and we do it because you know an individual basis as a criminal defense lawyer you know i've been i have clients and if i'm not going to stand up for those clients in the courts dealing with prosecutors dealing with the police dealing with judges and demand that they be treated fairly demand that they be treated as human beings with full respect for their integrity as people and demand that if they need help in some way whether that's you know treatment of some kind mental health treatment drug treatment or whatever that we look for solutions that can help them now those are individualized solutions they don't get to the fundamental issues and yet they're necessary i believe so this is why it's a dilemma so it's this is a question really for alex which is how do we have the understanding and how do we combine the understanding of the structural uh problems the the basic fundamental impossibility of our legal system of ever truly functioning in a just and fair way with the work that we are called to do and it's not just you know lawyers but you know, those of us uh deeply involved in community work um dealing with police departments where reforms are are on the table or changes are on the table and might make some incremental difference in the lives of of people on a day-to-day -day basis when we're called to do that work because that's what's necessary immediately how do we do that or do we do that i guess is a question and if we do do that how do we do that keeping in mind these fundamental structural issues which are at the core of how our legal system and our police operate so that was that's the first yeah, that's question. great that's great that's like a core question that needs to be dealt with here so first of all uh legal defense work within the criminal justice system is is not what i'm talking about that has to has to be done we need to use the law as effectively as we can as a tool to try to uh, defend people's rights and we we should continue to bring cases against the police for for misconduct and uh there there's a role for that both at the individual level of trying to get some relief or compensation and sometimes in terms of thinking of it as impact litigation and trying to get changes that might reduce the deadliness let's say of policing but there are some things to keep in mind here one is that most of the reforms that come out of that impact litigation process have not worked and most of the accountability mechanisms we've attempted to put in place over the last generation civilian review boards and uh, you know increased litigation and independent prosecutors they don't work first of all the problem is that what the police are doing is usually not illegal they even have a word for it in the in the sort of police scholarship community lawful but awful it's like <laughs> yes we can see this looks really awful but here are the seven reasons why it's actually lawful and the fact is do we see police officers going to jail for misuse of force on the job no we do not do they lose their jobs no they do not everyone made a big heroic yell when marilyn mosby indicted those six officers so quickly in baltimore after they killed freddy gray and she was a hero of the resistance for about 2 weeks well i wrote a piece <laughs> the next day that said this is not going to work I wrote a piece for the nation that said that we are not going to find out what really happened. These cops are not going to go to jail and no real reforms are going to result from this. And I am sorry to say that I have been pretty much entirely proven right on this. So, we must be careful about putting our energies into reforms that there's no real reason to believe they will bring relief. If only, if only they could. And we also have to be careful about setting up systems within the criminal justice system that we think will reduce its burden on people. 
And I'm thinking here specifically of specialized courts, drug courts, trafficking courts, mental health courts. You know, there was a, an appreciation within these institutions that many of the people coming before them were not, in fact, criminals. You know, whatever that means. That's my first lecture in my intro to criminology classes. You know, what, what, do, you, what do you even mean by what a criminal is? But uh, that, that these people needed help. But what help do they get in these settings? It turns out not very effective help provided under coercive threat. So when we look carefully at drug courts and trafficking courts, what we find is that they will say, well, people who complete the program have lower recidivism rates than people who didn't go into the program. And therefore, this is evidence-based and effective. Well, what they typically leave out of that analysis is all the people who entered the program but did not complete it, which turns out to be about 75% of the people. And for that 75% of the people, their experience of the specialized course courts is often worse than if they had just gone through the regular criminal justice system. We call this net widening. Because what happens is, is they come into court and they are subjected to these regimes of social control under the guise of treatment. Intensive monitoring, a lot of the treatment and help is organized around an ethos of personal responsibility and moral failure. So that if they have a relapse, it's their fault. They get more time in jail, shock treatment, these kinds of things. Shock treatment means send them to jail for 10 days and then let them out again. And then when they fail again, send them for 20 days. Instead of just going to court and paying the $100 fine when they were first arrested and then they can go on about their lives. We've now become this, all sex work is now trafficking, right? It's been redefined to make the arrest of these sex workers seem more legitimate when really we're just still arresting sex workers and now subjected them, subjecting them sometimes to even harsher punishments or these never-ending therapeutic regimes that never provide housing, employment, or adequate health care services which is what people actually need. And if we would just provide that to begin with, none of these institutions would be necessary in the first place. Thank you. I often say to my clients that my, uh, my goal is to get them out of the legal system as quickly as possible. That lingering in the system, which sometimes is, I mean, sometimes we don't have a choice. We're in, we linger in the system because we're not in control. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that, um, you know, sometimes I say, well, I want to do this. I want to fight this. I want to fight. And I say, my goal is to get you out. The more uh, you get involved with the legal system, the harder your life is going to be. And so I agree fully. Um, I'm going to open up for questions. I also, I just want to mention one thing. You mentioned yep. uh, Ms. Danner at the yep. beginning. I don't do you know what happened? Today? No, was there uh, a development yes, today? So, so there was a verdict today. This was um, this is the woman in the Bronx who was shot after yep. she picked up the baseball bat. Um, the cop was charged, went to trial um, before just a judge, not a jury. A judge who was a prosecutor for almost 30 years. And guess what? Um, so the officer, okay. was, the officer was acquitted of all charges today. This was just an instance. Okay, all right. Well, I was on the train today, so I missed that. Horrendous, really horrendous. Uh, Shocking so, and not shocking. Right. Yep. So, um, awful but awful. Why don't you, I don't, you don't need me to. Yeah, so let me take some questions here. Let, I'll start way in the back there so I don't forget. To, yes, in the Argyle sweater there. Uh, so, I work for the Albany Public Library, and um, I'd like to start getting copies of the libraries. So, yes. I'm going to do that. Um, that cool. And then a question would be how do you? So my general approach is to talk to people about the problems 
that are motivating their desire for coercive security mechanisms. Because people's perceptions of the problems may be exaggerated or even unfounded, but they do have these concerns. And if we don't address them, flash and, and, and not making long-term progress. So the security in the libraries is driven by some fears. And we need to get those fears on the table because a lot of them are unjustified, but generally not all of them. If we can get the fears on the table, we may be able to disabuse people of some of them. And then we need to figure out strategies for addressing the ones that remain, even if they may seem trivial. Because, you know, quality of life issues are not irrelevant and they are politically powerful. Mm -hmm. And we ignore them at our peril. So, is the problem that teenagers are too loud in the library? Or that a few books have been stolen? Or one time there was a fight? Okay, let's get that out on the table and let's talk about what can we do to address those issues without turning it into a criminal justice, armed security, metal detectors kind of problem. It's the same thing in the schools. Now, in the schools, it's a little bit of a different environment. I'm more familiar with it than, than the particularities of a library environment. But uh, we know in schools that when schools reorient their disciplinary policies towards restorative justice and community schools models, that students feel more secure, that problems are reduced, expulsions and suspensions drops, and kids don't get sent to prison. Now it has to be the whole school and the whole disciplinary system. Part of the problem, part of the bad rap that restorative justice has gotten is that in some places it's a little add-on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got to the suspensions, and but for something minor, we'll do this restorative justice thing. But for everything else, it's zero tolerance, get them out of there. That doesn't work. Have to reorient the whole institution because part of it is that the, the kids have to see what's going on as being for them and in their benefit and that they're a part of it. And that's going to be crucial for a library too, right? That the library is a space for the kids and that bad behavior in the library is bad for the kids and, and that everyone shares some ownership of that dynamic. Um, so, what, so what we have to do is we don't start, in my opinion, with get rid of the cops. We start with we've got a problem. There's a drug problem here in Troy. This may come as a surprise to you. No. Right now, the primary tool for dealing with that drug problem is policing. Well, in Ithaca, they decided to try something a little different. The mayor there was pretty clear that policing was not helping. So he brought together some folks from the harm reduction community, medical experts, people from treatment who were doing real stuff, and also people from his law enforcement agencies and said, he said to them, look, I want you to figure out an overall comprehensive approach to the problems such as they are. Not the abstract problem of drugs, but the actual problems as manifest in Ithaca. And they had a community component. We're going to have town hall meetings, focus groups, we're going to meet with stakeholders and see if we can come up with something. And nothing's off the table. Everything's on the table. Well, not surprisingly, policing is not on the list of things that are in the Ithaca plan. What's on the list? It, drug treatment, crisis centers, safe injection facilities, medical treatment models, investment in communities where youth joblessness is very high, the kinds of things that we would choose to do but are never on the table as an option. So that's what we gotta do. We've got to fight for these concrete, positive alternatives 
and point out that the police are part of the problem not the solution and if we need resources quit hiring more police and i'll just just to say i don't know who pays for those police in the library but i was in i was on a radio show in madison i did a little research connected with some people the kids there found out that the armed police in their schools were being paid for out of the school budget oh. And they were like, they were understandably outraged. And they're like, every dollar we spend on these guys who mistreat us could be going to instructional resources, counselors, after school programs. And so they are organizing to get that money back. Yes, sir. How you doing? Good. My name is Frank Leon Maven III. I'm the director of the North Central Community Solidarity Group Association. North Central Community where you are right now, you're right in the heart of it, okay? The one that you talked about where the young man got, I'm indirect with the young man and his family that got shot right there mm -hmm. on that on A Street, having to deal with it. But I'm directly associated with Mr. McDonald who got shot at the same corner right here on A Street, which we're all going to go by because there's no way of getting off this block without going around the A Street. So, you, so you're right in this. We were misled as to what this was. Uh, now I see why, okay, like a lot of us wanted to be here. Mm. We appreciate I, 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 I profound appreciation for everything that you brought here. Thank you. My question is, when are you coming back? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you come talk to me afterwards, we'll figure something out. Okay. I'm not that far away, so. Okay. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm in your, I'm in the thing, all right? I I have my email address. Okay, but you come talk to me afterwards and get my card and we'll we'll talk about what we can do because that's <clears throat> what I want to do with this, right, is how can we chart a new course here? And, uh, yeah, and I, I have come to Albany regularly, so there's no reason why we can't figure something out. Yeah. Well, why, yeah, you and then your friend next to you, so yes. My, my question, yeah, briefly, you mentioned... <laughs> <laughs> You mentioned well, you're friends now. <laughs> <laughs> We're all in this together. You mentioned civilian police review boards as one of the you know sort of technocratic fixes that doesn't doesn't go anywhere. And 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 so my question is is like that one seems to be the one with the the sort of the most potential, the one that could be most as incisive when they actually have teeth to them, and most of them, uh, you know, in the area are. Well, they don't exist, like in Detroit. Um, they're just advisory committees of just like loud people uh, on Facebook, uh, or or they are you know actual you know appointed boards by elected elected leaders, but they don't have subpoena powers. They don't have the power to terminate. Is it simply because like nationwide they're just too lit, or? Is it beyond that? When they, if, do, are there any examples where they have teeth and they just don't go far enough? So there are some different models out there. Now, the, the primary model that you see is the one that focuses on uh, investigation of individual acts of misconduct reported by the public. And these run the range from acts of discourtesy, offensive language, to excessive use of force. Now, in some cases, they have been good at carrying out investigations, and in, in the best cases, actually reviewing some patterns of bad practices and writing some reports that, that uh, provide some transparency to the nature of the problem. But they have pretty much universally failed at actually producing accountability. In almost all circumstances, whatever findings they arrive at, still can't, won't be acted on without the approval of whoever's in charge of the police department. They reserve the right to discipline as the final arbiter. And what we find is that sort of regardless of how that mechanism is articulated or, or carried out, that officers are not getting fired, the culture of policing doesn't change, and more importantly, the problems of policing are not the problems of individual police misconduct. These officers, one of the reasons they don't get disciplined is that they are doing what they were taught and told to do. And this is often their defense. Here is the regulation I was carrying out. This is the training that I was given. 
I'm sure, I know that was part of what happened in this case in the Bronx. So this is the problem with civilian complaint review boards and, and oversight boards and independent investigation bodies of various kinds. I get these emails from erstwhile supporters. Well, you didn't really take this on. Aren't we doing great work? And I'm sorry, but I don't think this is the solution. Uh, there are things out there that could be used to build pressure and be part of a sort of non-reform reform movement. Uh, in some cases, uh, inspector general offices that actually have subpoena power, that actually look at practices and policies, not individual misconduct, have been good not in reforming police but in providing much needed transparency because they get in and they find out what that policy was and why it's producing all these bad outcomes and then they make it public so that we can use it as ammunition. So that's been good. Some people are enth enthusiastic about what's going on in Seattle where they have this citizen police commission that's elected and, and has broad constituencies represented and has been trying to um, directly challenge policies and practices that are problematic. I mean, stuff like that could be part of building for something but it needs to have the broader analysis driving it or it will devolve into technocratic fixes and procedural justice, you know, that if we just follow through on the legal motions, everyone will be satisfied even when the outcomes are terrible. Yeah. Um, I'm really interested in the, this question of the, the structure of the system. I, I've been working through uh, Martha Newsbaum's Anger and Forgiveness, which is really trying to talk about, like, well, well, the, the nature of what we think of as justice and anger. Yeah. And, and you point out this idea that uh, the legal system ultimately is, is largely about retribution. Uh, we might like it because under a liberal mode, it's like, well, it, it, it tempers the blood feud that exists between people, and it's a, a neutral arbiter, but it's still laying down this retribution. Um, what, what I'm really curious about is, um, given that sort of notion that retribution uh, is justice. Uh, it, it's, it's fair. It's not that the cops bashed in the kid's head, that he bashed in the wrong kid's head. Um, what it is, I guess, the hope or the challenge of, of really instituting some of these policies about changing the legal system uh, independent of really addressing the way communities think about, about, about violence? I mean, at the end of the day, um, do you see people willing to let go of retribution if it produces better outcomes? Yeah, well, th I sometimes think maybe this is the next project for me, is this this the, this interrogation of what justice is, because we've completely lost any idea about what justice is. I mean, we, it's just not, I think we're totally in the weeds on, on this question, which is ironic when we at the same time hear all this religious discourse about what a religious Christian society we are and how we spend so much time in front of televangelists and these mega churches and uh, love, forgiveness, mercy, the, that's the big three for Christianity and actually for a lot of other religions too. And, but, but where do you see that operating in our public culture? Not at all. Now, I believe that the uh, deep part of the root of that is the, the nature of race relations, that, that our antipathy towards blacks and, and indigenous populations before them or simultaneous to them, uh, created a dynamic where some people were deserving and other people weren't. And that was so toxic, so toxic, that it perverted these ideas of justice. And we must remember that the United States was a colonial settler state that was founded on genocide and slavery. And that is part of our culture, one of violence for personal and group gain. And that colors the way we see the world. Even though many of us come from families that 
came here after the genocide and after slavery, it is still part of the ethos of the American experience. And look at the gun culture and the complete unwillingness to engage it in any real way. I think it's all a continuation of those mindsets. Yes, ma'am. Um, two, I might make a comment. One today, um, the consequences of uh, institutionalizing and affirming uh, brute force and control uh, destroyed 17 lives. Um, and I think it's ironic and interesting in light of your comments uh, that the individual who was a hero was the cop. You know what I mean? And uh, uh, it's tragic, but um, and, and the, the moral emptiness that no one has said it is collectively that it's wrong to be walking killing kids and people. It's like, well, it's just, and it's a uh, it's an apathy um, in this country that is just it's sad. It's very scary. I, I have to admit, it's, uh, and, and I do agree that, let's not kid ourselves, the primary responsibility of police in this country is to oppress, to control. I mean, really, what's the point? And, uh, that is the end of policing. <laughs> <laughs> that is the end. Of, you know, that's a double meaning on purpose here in the title. Yeah. And it's an institution that has been in its origin until the current time. Its role and responsibility is to control the masses. And um, it's like the criminal justice system. It's like the, I mean, really, what do you do with the people? that uh, you marginalize, that you expose, that you squeeze. Well, you know what you do? You lock them up. I mean, in the New York Times, it said that Haldeman and Nixon came up with the idea of the war on crime. I, I, the war on drugs, yes. Yeah, that, I, those I, quotes are, are in chapter six, I think it is. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And that history is in chapter two. So, yes, I, I think we're very much in agreement, and I think that the problem is worse than one of apathy. Yeah, but I want to close, but yep. my point is that I agree with you, and I feel that we have to think outside of the box. We have to think outside of the box. And that's why if we we, you're absolutely correct. It's like uh, I said to an attorney once on a case. I asked a guy, he was facing life, and I asked him, if you, well, are you willing to stand up to the system if 150 men, black men, were willing to say, you know what, I will tie up the courts. Yep, demand a trial. Know, let's yeah. go to trial. Let's go, knowing that they're going to do 20 to life. And you want to know something? In my 30 years facing those kind of men, I've asked them. And you know what? They said they do it. They do it. They do it just like Malcolm. Like, you don't understand what I mean? But they never ask. They never ask. <coughs> Over here. Yep. Um, yeah, it really struck me what you said about police as the enforcers of the structural inequality. But just thinking on a personal and neighborhood level, you know, I, I don't think we have any elites in this room, it's probably fair to say. Um, but also it's probably fair to say that most of us are going home to a, a warm bed and some food in the cupboard, and if we live in Troy, um, there's a lot of people living in proximity to us who aren't, who don't have that. Um, and so, and, uh, but we're going to do so fairly comfortably, a little bit because we know there's police. Or if the kitchen window breaks tonight and go downstairs and someone's walking out of the room with a computer, you know, we're probably not going to rap at them about educational opportunity. <laughs> you know, and the elites are there. They don't need police coming to their house. They're living in their own world. But just as you envision a literal end of policing, how can we envision an institution 
an institution that replaced that. Yeah, no, that's that kind of thing. that's a that's a very important question, and I do not ever start with the, a conversation with this kind of like, well, let's imagine a world without police, you know, or let's have no police tomorrow. I don't say that anywhere in the book. I don't engage that kind of language. I don't think it's helpful. What I do is start today to try to figure out other ways to deal with them. And to the extent that we can, then we should replace policing with that. If there are things that we can't figure out, maybe we can't figure them out now, maybe we got a long term, so then, then we work on that. So I agree, it's not helpful to tell people who can't walk safely down the street, oh, let's just get rid of all the police in your neighborhood, that'll make you safer. No, if we don't build up the alternatives, then, then we'll just have unsafety and political backlash and more demands for the police. Yeah. Yep. Um, I'm doing. I'm working on a book on what's wrong with the mental health system and alternatives. And the mental health system is also a system of social control. Um, so I just wanted to make a comment. Um, while most people, I, I, it's, this book in, involves interviews with many people who would be considered as having, at one point, serious and persistent mental illness. And there's a lot about going to be a lot about alternatives. But while most people are not coerced, a number of people are, they're given an alternative. Um, we're going to coerce you if you don't do it. So they're, they're in effect coerced. Yeah, that's the problem with mental health courts. Right, but, but for I just, instance. you know, and so I, I haven't read your book yet. I, I'm eager to. But, you know, so often people say this, this doesn't belong in the realm of policing. It's, it's, a, it's a medical problem. It belongs in mental health without looking at the fact that they're really very similar. They, they can be. They certainly can be. They, yeah. People's experiences. People's experience can be. Yeah, this does not uh, just embrace simplistically well, like sure. every yeah. give. You know, one of the problems with the way we do mental health now is that, you know, people get taken to an emergency room held for a day or two or three and then given a bottle of pills and sent out back out on the streets. And that is not a solution to whatever their problem well, is. I or, think there's something else that's very similar that. Mental, the mental health system is being asked to deal with so many problems that were never in mental health. Yes. And because people have problems of dislocation and lack of community support and Absolutely. lack of economic possibilities and all kinds of deviant behavior that gets thrown into mental health. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Right up here, and then I'll go back. Into that. Yep. Um, so this is a two-part question. Um, for one, I'm wondering what organizations or movements you think. Of currently on the forefront of addressing policing from the angle that you're advocating. Mm -hmm. And the second part of the question is, I'm wondering to what extent you see a meaningful distinction between the methods of urban and rural policing and the methods of addressing those. Great. So um, th this report by the Center for Popular Democracy is really excellent because it's co-written by organizations on the ground in places like Oakland and Los Angeles and St. Louis and Houston who are doing this work. So I, I'm blanking on the exact title because the Center for Popular Democracy has a website, racial, their Racial Justice Project produced this report. You know, in Oakland, they have been waging this battle against the police budget and they've articulated the kinds of community investments that they think would make their community safer. They put dollar amounts on things, they've been mobilizing, they've been doing door to door camp. It's real, broad, grassroots movement that are creating a new left at the local level. In Los Angeles, the Youth Justice Coalition, which is made up of dozens of groups, many of them very grassroots, poor people's organizations, they did some research. They found that the, the LA County was spending $10 billion a year on policing and jails. And they're like, if we could have 5% of that money, it could fund an unlimited number of youth jobs, neighborhood violence interrupters, after school programs, and they laid out a whole program 
that they believe would reduce the problems of youth violence, black market involvement, and all this stuff. So this work is happening. We need to get involved. I've been like speaking to DSA chapters and stuff. They've got a, an abolitionist plank in their kind of national platform. I don't think they know what it means, many of them. <laughs> and I am trying to, to let, this is what it means. This is what it means. This work is what it means. And there's nothing about this work that is inconsistent with their basic political analysis, as far as I can tell, from looking at the documents. And I, I have a long history with DSA going back decades. So I know it's in a new, invigorated form, which is very exciting. But they've got to start doing some work, not just talking about it. Yeah, I've been to Cuba a couple times in the last two years, and the notable thing about walking around Havana is not seeing any police. I mean, I think the one time I saw an emergency vehicle it was an ambulance. Um, I don't know if you have any, and, and in May Day last year in Cuba, the security people at the, who were standing out alongside the parade route, unlike New York, where they're, and they're always armed to the teeth, they got fences and everything else. They were wearing wire bearer shirts with no weapons. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean. <laughs> yeah, Cuban policing is not perfect. There are problems with uh, discriminatory enforcement and how sex work is managed, and there's some corruption. But, you know, they don't abuse homeless people because they don't have any homeless people. <laughs> <laughs> You know, they have eliminated problems from being police problems by actually addressing the underlying problem. So, in that sense, it's a model that we could look at. Yes, in the back, standing up. So, um, I wanted to ask about one problem that is um, traditionally dealt with by police, and it's not, you know, been dealt with particularly well, which is the traffic enforcement. Um, as someone who And um, I had um, seen uh, sort of the kind of surveillance um, automation as kind of a solution there using uh, speed cameras uh, as a way of solving this problem. But, um, so I'd like to hear your thoughts on um, sort of this technocratic kind of ideas, but and I'm guessing that you are, that is not a solution. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, look, there is research that shows that uh, some of these technological things have shown some improvements, so we, we need to be aware of what the research shows. Um, there's always a problem when we rely on fines as the primary mechanism for managing this behavior because that burden falls much more heavily on some than others and can lead to further criminal justice involvement. There are other kinds of technocratic fixes to our traffic problems. The way our streets are designed, the way our mass transit is organized, these things contribute to traffic deaths. The way our cars are designed. So there are, for instance, traffic calming measures that can be put in place in, in urban areas. And oh, I didn't address your rural question, which I will just say a thing about in a second. Uh, <coughs> that we can use speed bumps, we can use choke points, we can create bike lanes that are separated by a row of cars or curbs or things that will reduce traffic fatalities and things like that. What we know in general about uniform traffic enforcement is that it is not effective and that it is incredibly burdensome and that it tends to be racially biased. So that is not a good tool to use. It, it should be always understood as a kind of tool of last resort. Let's look for non-punitive solutions as much as possible. And then if we are left with things and we have evidence that shows that they can be effective, then we can talk about that. As for the urban-rural thing, I do talk about rural issues explicitly in here. I mean, the war on drugs is being carried out in rural places that have been economically devastated. The mechanization and corporatization of agriculture, the hollowing out of infrastructure investment, 
uh, has been, you know, deindustrialization has been devastating for many rural areas, and they are hurting, and they have real problems like opioid abuse, methamphetamines, um, and policing has been turned to as a solution in many of those places as well. And some of the worst abuses of policing are really in rural areas where the training standards are lower and the bias is more explicit. And But it's just a matter of degree, not of kind. Uh, so yes, uh, the, the same dynamics are at work there. Yeah? How, do, uh, how could district attorneys fit into ending policing? Can you talk a little bit about that office and maybe Mark if you want to play on that? Yeah, we had a good conversation about that at dinner. Um, there's an interesting kind of movement afoot uh, to focus more on prosecutors. Uh, Jonathan Pfaff's book, Locked In, uh, is a good starting point for looking at their central role in the perpetuation of mass incarceration. It's a little bit of an antidote to some of Michelle Alexander's arguments. Uh, really says, look, if we look county by county across the United States, we can see that it's these local prosecutors and how they're charging people and the sentences they're asking for that actually drove the increases more than federal legislative changes or other things. Uh, so they are a central component for mass incarceration. My goal is to put them out of business because they don't generate cases, they prosecute the ones that have been brought to them. Well, we need to quit bringing them these cases. Mm -hmm. So yes, I've been involved in efforts to get the DAs in New York City to quit prosecuting turnstile jumping and low-level marijuana arrests, and I'm all for that. And some of that could feed back into changing underlying police practices. So there, there is something there. But ultimately, what, what I'm trying to say with this book is that the focus on mass incarceration and its interest in legislative problems and prosecutors is missing the front end of the system in important ways. And it, we just need to quit thinking that these are criminal justice problems in the first place and just remove them from those institutions. Yes, in the back. Um. I think it's really great that you're here. Um, I, I've never heard of you before a couple of years. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I have now. One thing that stuck with me, you know, something I've been aware of, but like hearing people say it makes you think about it, is that policing is working as intended. Like this is how it's supposed to be based on the system. Mm -hmm. But I think one thing that I struggle with, and I think a lot of people may struggle with, is learning to identify systems in the way that they work and how they're supposed to work. So like, when you're trying to bring it to other people and talk about, yeah, this is how policing is supposed to work, and think we can do instead of policing because that system itself is not broken, but working as intended, how do you, how do you kind of bring into light what those systems are supposed to be and how to identify them, not just by what exists, but on your own kind of cognizance. So pointing out a situation where, okay, this is a system and it's not broken, it's working. Well, so what, part of what I try to do is to lay out the history. To say that you know police have never been about what we are led to believe that they're about, and I talk a little bit about why we have these misconceptions. Part of it's this liberal framework, but also, you know, our our national entertainment culture is a giant machine for producing police legitimacy and for <laughs> obfuscating the nature of policing. And I talk about in the book how I grew up in the era of Adam Twelve and the mod squad, and while we think of, I, you all too young to remember these shows, some of us remember, but anyway, the, these were shows that were produced in the late 60s in the wake of Watts and Detroit and the rioting, and they, one was, took a professional approach, Adam 12, and the other was like, oh, let's imagine a more diverse, hip, 
culturally sensitive police force, but the goal was the same in both, which was to reproduce or to produce legitimacy in the police. One was the LA model, which is that we're just professional, neutral enforcers of the law. We just want the facts. We, we don't, you know, we're not ideologues. We're not racist. All of which was completely untrue because they were all those things. That's why Watts <laughs> happened, and that's why they produced that show. The, these shows were actually co-produced with the police. The, at the end of Adam Twelve, it's you know this has been approved by the police commission of the city of Watts based on real story. You know these just like today shows like Cops and real life stories of the highway patrol, they're co-produced with local police departments to produce these false understandings about what the nature of policing is. So, but as a practical matter, how do you change people's perceptions of these institutions? Well, I think part of what we need to do is constantly point out that it doesn't do what we think it should be doing. It doesn't really make us safe. It doesn't really produce justice. It's not like there's no crime. We've had a war on drugs for 40 years. Drugs are cheaper, of higher quality, and easier to get than they have ever been. Is there any high school kid in this part of New York State who can't get any kind of drugs they want anytime they want them? Mm -hmm. I always say to my students, if your grade in this class depended on whether or not you could get illegal drugs by next class, is there anyone who would be at risk of failing? <laughs> These are the good kids, right? These are the kids who stayed in school, who overcome a lot of challenges to make it to Brooklyn College. And they just, they react how you laugh, right? They, they, they all laugh. Every once in a while, a hand will be like, ah, and I'm like, really? You don't know who you would call to get the ball rolling? And they're like, Oh yeah, I know. <laughs> so these systems don't work to do what they claim to be doing, right? So we just got to constantly point that out. Ask people, do you feel safe? People don't feel safe, especially in neighborhoods with a lot of police. And one of the things we know about schools with a lot of police is that the kids in the schools don't feel safe. They feel less safe than the school down the street that doesn't have police. Because the police themselves produce an air of insecurity. So I think we're, we have one time more? for maybe one, one more question. Okay, let's see how quick we can do it. <laughs> to, to what extent is uh, like private, non-state police or security forces uh, driving the problem? <laughs> right. So that's a great question because there's a, there's a lot packed in there. One of the narratives we hear about reforming the criminal justice system is that we got to get rid of private prisons and for-profit prison labor and these things, all of which is true. That is not driving this problem. The private gain that emerges out of these institutions is gravy. If only that were the problem. The problem is so much worse than that. What drives these institutions is a much deeper, much more cynical politics that mobilizes racial animus and fear to perpetuate profound economic exploitation and inequality. And that is what has to be directly addressed. And of course, a system like that is going to find ways for individuals and corporations to make money off of it. But the problem is so much broader and deeper than that. And boycotting this company or that company or pointing out that this company is doing this bad thing, that is not going to fix this. So we have time for maybe Brett. Or, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. What? Mine is a little disconnected. I just wanted to mention I'm from other countries in Spain. I'm connected to what he's saying, but not separating between private and public, but rather with the uh, efficiency of those institutions, if they are 
if either they are from the state or play or like they are, as I understand here, working by numbers. Mm -hmm. And that's how it, I encountered most of the institutions here, police institutions, medical institutions, university institutions, and I'm terrified, no? entering, as you were saying, entering into any of these institutions can totally change your life here. So it's a bit related to this, but I was wondering if, if this is not a kind of reform that makes a little bit sense. I was talking with a uh, police once in Spain, and, and he was telling me how, compared to the United States system, he was, um, he was admiring the, the United States. He was saying, yes, because you can pay to the do all the things you can. We cannot do that in Spain because that's forbidden. You cannot be inside crime and you have a job forever. <laughs> so like, you understand? Yeah, you well, this is part of this expansion of police power that we have here, right, which is that they can entrap people, that they can develop numeric quotas, that they can develop secret algorithms for deciding who's already guilty before they do stuff. So, yes, we have incredibly sophisticated and powerful institutions at work here that produce injustice. That's their basic mission. They think it's something else, but it's not really. It's not quite nine. You had your hand. Yeah. Oh, no, you, uh, you're, you, you addressed it. Okay. One, one more in the back here. Actually, a lot of it is linked to neoliberalism, and um, we're seeing that in effect right now, especially with ICE. And this, like, now suddenly anybody who's not a citizen who has a criminal conviction is automatically going to be deported. And it's just an arrest? No, just, yeah, just an arrest. Not even a conviction often. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, um, I, I think that it goes to speak to like our mentality of like um, how we look at people who have arrests, and it like feeds into the for-profit like prison enslavement system. And um, so, currently, I mean, a couple of other people are working with a family who is resisting ICE right now, like within <laughs> our community up here in Albany, um, and. We brought flyers, and uh, we need to ask for money from people um, because they have to they have to pay like ridiculous amounts just like in terms of like the the paperwork, the like, immigration paperwork, and um, and like other things. And so I wanted to ask if I could like pass a basket around to help this family. Mm. And if anybody wants to like come and talk to me about this afterwards, I would really love to connect with people. Um, that's great so I think we're going to break up so the passing maybe you can just stand by the door as people are getting because I think everyone's going to get up but let me just say about this imagining a world without police it's not that we can't have settings where we can have that conversation I don't think it makes sense to go on the radio or television and start a conversation that way because that just ends the conversation for the vast majority of people because they don't know what that means. It sounds ridiculous and scary and whatever and there is a message you can give to those people and we should focus on that. And to the extent that we can produce community resources that undermine the need for police at every step, that's what this whole thing is about. So I applaud the work that you're doing. And thanks for the fantastic questions. <laughs>